Today will be a more chilled stream, I guess. Because rather than some step-by-step -step tutorial, I'd rather start a fresh project with you. And we're gonna try from scratch. Basically from Unreal's content, we're gonna try how to build a level. So kinda showing my way of thinking and how, how, how I would approach this thing. I've started Unreal Engine 5. Let's hope it behaves better this time. Okay, as you can probably see, it's compiling shaders. And I don't know why, but for Unreal Engine 5, there is a ton more shaders to compile. Uh, so it just ended compiling 4,000 shaders. Now it started compiling 7,000 more when I opened them up. But it can do it in the background. Polygon about the Gumroad content. So uh, there is a Math Essentials project there that I think you may find interesting. But right now it's uh, four videos. Gamma count update. This is what I what I mentioned. This uh, math essentials videos. So yeah, dot product, linear interpolation, sign, ah, and advanced sign. So this was omitted on the stream, but this is about how to basically what is the performance of sign in real time, how to uh, approximate it using simpler functions, and if you should do that or not and how to use math expression nodes and rotate textures using sine and cosine. So that's the thing. Uh, but here I have this uh, example project files. These are from my YouTube tutorials, the older ones from 2019 and older. But I've recently converted them to Unreal Engine 5. So if you get this, you get also this project for Unreal Engine 5 and you can basically check what has changed. One funny thing that has changed is that my, uh, how it's called, good looking randomization tutorial, it doesn't work as nice as it did in Unreal Engine 4. Because here you can see the building having randomized items on every floor. One floor has air conditioning and other doesn't. This was done through uh, opacity mask. So each module was randomizing its uh, noise value, kind of, and assigned alpha of zero to certain parts of the match. The problem is that with Nanite in Unreal Engine 5, this do doesn't longer work, because Nanite doesn't support any kind of alpha, not even opacity mask. So this will be one problem we'll be dealing with today. Basically, if we can replace that with just placing meshes and we'll Nanite optimize that, despite these are not imported, but blueprint constructed. Because all this building was like one module, but constructed in the blueprint. So we'll deal with similar problems today, though without alpha in the shader. So yeah, if you get this, you also get Unreal Engine 5 project. Okay. We can start the basic, basic blueprint. Dan Landish, thank you for following. How you create a modular wall in Blueprint? The bare bones example. Let's make a uh, folder for ourselves. Uh, basically, I know this is a static mesh that we want to create, but this is an actor. So create an actor. BP and modular wall. Okay. And this is what I'm explaining is the super basic stuff. So guys, I think if you know this and uh, you got something, you got some things to do, then you can also jump in in half an hour if you're, let's say, too advanced for this child topics. But I think for many it may be interesting. Okay, so we place a blueprint. This is a default empty icon. Control E to open the editor. Okay, so our blueprint. Uh, normally, you would add a static mesh component here, like this, a uh, static mesh. But for this, we may try instancing, because why not? Uh, if you're using the same mesh, but multiple times, and it's always the same mesh, just different transformations, it's good to go with instant static mesh or hierarchical instant static mesh. It means that there will be only one copy of the original mesh, and it will be distributed on the GPU. Uh, like uh, cheap clones. Uh, the difference is that instant static mesh doesn't support LOD well. 
hierarchical does. So we usually want that. I don't know yet what's the difference for Nanite, but I'd rather go with this. There is no like uh, downsides to it. Okay, we have it. Now we can put a static mesh here already, uh, but maybe it's better to do a variable that the user will be able to assign that. Uh, then Landish says that Nanite doesn't support LODs. Okay, so it's good to know that it doesn't treat the, its own LODs as, as the actual LOD. Let's see how it handles this hierarchical stuff. Uh, where am I? What's happened? Okay. And yeah, so instead of placing a mesh here, I will create a variable and uh, mesh module. Uh, good. And the variable type will be static mesh. Mesh. Yeah. Of type, yeah, it's probably of screen, but of type object reference. Uh, all right. And now in construction script. Construction script, for the, those of you who don't know, is basically a blueprint, a logic that's run whenever something is changed in the object in the editor. Uh, Unreal log, uh, you're saying big thank you for, for your Unreal tech guides. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, so construction script, what happens? Uh, you can, for example, take this hierarchical instance static mesh that we have and add instance. So yeah, construction script is exactly what the name says. It's the logic of how the blueprint will be built instead of building it manually here. So it can use whatever you manually place, but it can also add new stuff like here. It takes the hierarchical instance mesh component and adds a new instance. And now this is for later, because first thing we need to do, let's use a sequence. Okay. The first thing we need to do is to take the same instance thing and set mesh. When you set mesh, you tell it what mesh to use. So it's the same thing as setting this here. Usually, whenever you see something here in the properties page, you can find the same thing under right click when dragging off from the object. So I want to set this mesh to this mesh module variable. Now, whatever uh, is here, I'd rather make user edit this on the level. So I click here on the eye icon and now it's exposed. I will show it in a moment. So first thing, I set the static mesh. Second thing, I add for now a single instance. I will change this in a, in a second. It doesn't compile because transform doesn't exist. Make transform. Location zero. This is all, all relative to the uh, to the component. Okay, now it compiles. So as you can see in the viewport, ah, I have to assign something as the default. When you click a variable on the right, you have details and the default value. So my default mesh will be this very nice stairs, for example, for now. Okay. Save. Perfect. So. This is our stairs. If I change this mesh variable here, it changes here. Okay. So now for more complex stuff, uh, there's one thing you want to do. If this is going to be static, no changes, no nothing, no real, real time changes, then mobility of this hierarchical instance static mesh should be static. Okay. Uh, let me rename it to instance group, just, you know, it won't take as much space. <laughs> so I set the mobility to static. Often you want to disable physics. It makes instancing much, much uh, faster. Here we need physics. We want this uh, to collide with player and so on. But, you know, collision, typically you can do no collision. It uh, speeds things up a ton. Casting shadows, yes or not. This will propagate the settings to every instance. Because instancing 
basically means that you have the same settings, the same mesh, the same everything, and you just clone it for free without changing anything uh, except for transformation. That's why it's so fast. Uh, okay, so we start static mesh. Now, instead of adding a single instance, let me add a variable, not here, here. Uh, it will be instance count, number of instances, type integer. Uh, okay, and this will become for loop, not for each loop, for loop. Okay, so first index is zero, last index is instance count. So how many meshes do we want? Minus one, because it's the last index. Mm. So yeah, let's not have an off by one error. Like so. So it will go to zero to this, from zero to this. Now, in every iteration of this loop, add a new instance. But this time we have to change the transform so it doesn't stuck in the same place. Uh, so location should be what? Basically location, instance count is zero by default, is like one. We have one instance, of course, if I now do five, they will spawn in exactly the same spot, right? So what we want is the length of the mesh to multiply it by the instance index to move it further. So to get the length, uh, I don't want to do it in the loop body because it's always the same. So I'd rather do it here. Uh, I make a local variable, mesh length. It will be float. Okay. Of course, length depends on the axis, but we'll, uh, we'll set one of the axis. Mesh module, the same mesh as we used here. This, you know, asset reference. And it has get bounds. Get bounds or get bounding box. Let's say get bounds. Uh, yeah, when I split this thing, now I have box extend. Box extend is the half of the size of the mesh. So when I take it, uh, let's break it into float. Okay, and I'm interested, let's say, in axis Y, or not. Uh, let's store it in the variable. Uh, times 2, because it's half of the mm, bound size. Times 2, like this. So, the sec... oh, sorry. Uh, the second thing that I do is setting this variable. I save the mesh length as optimization. I don't want to, you know, repeat this every time unnecessarily. Okay. And now the location, let me split that. The location will be mesh length multiplied by this. Multiply by the number of instance. So the first instance will be, you know, zero. The next instance will be one length of the mesh. The, the second two lengths of the mesh, and so on. Uh, here, I multiply the length of the mesh by this thing, and move it. Let's see. Perfect. This is it. So now, if I change the instance count, I can do it on the level, uh, but I have to expose it. I expose it by this I icon. Okay? Yeah, now we have it here. Instance count. So this is the basic, basic method of doing stuff. And now, what I need is something to connect these pieces, because this is, like, these stairs are okay, they fit very well, but in more realistic case, it would be something like a wall. Let's find a mesh like this. I don't know if we have one. The project is downloading. Give me a second. Carfi, thanks for following. And welcome. Okay. 
Let's go to the content browser because I won't ever find it. What's that? It's a content browser within another window. Wow. <laughs> uh, starter content. Why is it hiding automatically? Oh, no, better. Hmm. Shapes. Too simplistic. Uh, architecture. That's all oh, exactly. That's what we wanted. So now going back to the blueprint. Wall 400 by 200. Compile. As you can see, now it's stacking in the. And now it's uh, duplicating the wrong direction in the wrong axis. So let me move that. I can also rotate the basic mesh. Borgir, thanks for following. Have a nice time here today. Okay, does it work now? I've moved it to location X. Uh, let's try one in zero instances. One, two. Uh oh, something's wrong. Ah, sorry. Because if location X, then I should also get bounce X. Like that. Now it's better. All right. Perfect. Now I want something to connect these pieces because this is quite okay, but normally you would see, you know, the, the edges of this thing, you know, the, the boundaries. So some nice pillar will be welcome. We have a pillar here. Perfect. So let's add another mesh. Uh, let's say mesh connector. Okay. And also static mesh of object reference type and this mesh connector I have to compile the print it will be the pillar so uh, every single iteration of the loop uh, every single iteration of the loop I want to also add another instance this time of this pillar thing and I can reuse the transform I can do it, problem. But also what I need is I, I want to add another transform, uh, like a little offset to this pillar to, to put it in the right place. So I make a variable connector transform form, and the type will be transform. Perfect, user editable, no clever math. Uh, and I want to add another transform. Add local, local, or combine transformations. How do you do it? I don't remember. Compose, beautiful. Compose with this. Okay. Why is it wrong? Tell me. Ah, sure. I need another instance group because an instance group has only one static mesh type. So instance group connector and instance group wall, for example. Perfect. And I also need to set this mesh here again. So wall is here and for the connector I want to also set static mesh. Mesh connector. And this time, this group. Perfect. Ha! Huh. You see, that's why I needed the transform to be exposed. Uh, Let's go back, expose it again. It's somewhere here. Yeah. So scale down. Oops. What? Ah, no, it's over. Scale half, half, half. X maybe more. I know it's not professional, but you know. Normally you'd have some better prepared modules, I don't. Like so. OK. 
Okay, cool. Why do I have less pillars? Does this... Ah. It scales the thing. I want it only to scale the single thing. So before movement, not after. This should offset them. Does it? It does, okay. Hmm. This transform is weird. Uh, how to do it, basically? Let's do it another way. I won't combine them because I only want to control the scale and the local, uh, local location. And apparently this influences the entire thing. So, I'll take that. And I will... Let's scale, if possible, or no, make transform again, transform, now from this connector transform, I will, I will break this thing down, like, add locations to each other, I will skip rotation because I don't need rotation, and I will just directly put the scale here. Because here it's always 1. Okay, so I break down this transform and just manually add it. Let's see. But maybe this is the problem. No, it's good. So now I can scale it. Like this. And nothing's... Mm, the location is not influenced. Yeah, so... Make another transform and just add things manually. Landa should say that in real situation, before the modular thing, uh, you decide. I should decide to import meshes without side planes or trim like meshes, without uh, invisible polygons. Kind of, but it depends because sometimes it's better to have full meshes for situations like this. I know it, you can you can have it under control, but not always, uh, you know, there may be a mistake. For example, someone, I don't know, someone places a wall manually, then your modular wall, and just by mistake, they end up with something like this, right? So finding such situations is very complex in the actual game. So it's often, I think, better, and I've seen this in production, to leave a couple more polygons, like the closing ones, rather than a hole inside, uh, just to prevent errors like this, visual errors. And there's another thing that occlusion works better with solid meshes. Because sometimes if, if you have transparent here, you can accidentally see a big chunk of the city, for example, behind it. So it's better to have it closed, just to be sure. I think, my opinion. Uh, but yeah, you mean, for performance, this is also another concern that if we do stuff like this, basically occluding polygons with other polygons, we're wasting some computation time. Mm. So the thing I want to check today is how much you can now do stuff like this in Unreal without depending, for example, on Houdini to generate such a wall and then optimize it in Houdini. Because that's a good point, that if you end up with too many modules, uh, you know, uh, intersecting each other, then uh, then you're wasting a lot of polygons inside, and that's actually a problem. Uh, so normally stuff like this was constructed, for example, in Houdini, then imported. What I want to check, if it's Nanite, really works like it's, uh, you know, advertised, that it has very fine occlusion, very, uh, you know, uh, s small patches can also occlude things behind it, not only a huge like volume. If that's the case, then for example, in theory, in Nanite, this polygon should occlude the parts of the polygon behind it. I don't know. We will see. Mm, we'll see later when we have some actual meshes, but that's one of the goals for today how far you can go with construction script, how crazy you can go, and uh, what's the actual performance. Because in Unreal Engine 4, you would end up with some, uh, you know, 
issues because there's too many geometry put inside other geometry or under the floor or something. Okay, so we have nice wall with nice modules. Mm, material is very straightforward. I'd rather use material from this mesh right now. But uh, let's see, it's, let's check its UVs. How is it prepared? If it's good, then I can show it already. Uh, UV channel. I don't know if it's alright. Or maybe it is. Let's try putting some texture. Uh, it has a material called basic wall. I will make a new one. Mm. Procedure level. Ah, actually, this should be in a folder. Blueprints. Go here. Yes. Clean up. And now, new folder. Materials. M. Modular piece. Okay. So, the first thing. Texture, sample, param. Right? And base color. Base color. Do we have some bricks in the started content? We do. We do. Base color. Now, this will be roughness. Do they use roughness textures? Or do they pack everything into one? I think they pack. So red looks like roughness, green occlusion, and blue, I don't know. <laughs> Let's use green and red. Alpha is empty. Uh, so this was a roughness, this was a collusion. Ah, and there is normal. Normal map. So Landish says that, uh, as I figured out what the nanites are, it takes boundary box and divides it by pre-calculated primitives before rasterization. So occlusion should be very good with nanites, I guess. Okay. Okay, I see what you mean, that nanite splits things into these little patches of geometry. That's a super interesting thing, because it means that you can now import huge, like huge meshes without splitting them into smaller modules. Nanite should, in theory, do that for you. So, you're right, this will be very good for our use case. Okay, does it work? Let's put it on this wall. Like so. Seems to work. Doesn't look pretty, but hey. It's okay. Where is this uh, light? I want some more light here. Okay. It's a wall. Cool. So now what we want to do is to add some kind of variation to it. Because normally... Maybe it's not visible here, but if I, let's say, if I take UVs, just to prove the point, if I take noise and uh, position will be my UVs, so text card, text card, um, then you'll be able to see repetition. Does it work? Or... It has compilation errors. Why? Which errors? Material expression cannot convert from float to OK. Append vector. Yeah, what I want to show you is that normally uh, when the module is repeated, everything is repeated. So the UVs will be the same, right? Because the same match. That's one of the big problems of instancing treated, let's say, in a naive way. Uh, that's how it would look like. Um, so what I would like to do instead is 
I can use word position for that, sure, but that's not the case, because it's just an example. I want to talk about standard textures that they repeat. It's not visible here due to the uh, content of this texture, but they do. So, uh, what I'd like to do is either to have word projected UVs or to add some variation per module. It depends whether I need continuity. If I don't need continuity, I could take instance per instance random and add some random X or U to the UVs. So let me show that thing. Uh, I bring back the noise. Uh, so here, what I would do is another append, basically treat it as the, you know, X and Y, so U and V. V won't change, U will be instance random. And now let's say multiply, uh, even before, not to waste calculations, uh, multiply that by UV randomization. Okay. And now I can add, because as I've explained already in one of the streams, when it comes to positions, multiplication is scaling, adding is moving. So offset, add equals offset. Uh, so I will add a random U position offset to the U coordinate. For now it won't do anything because it's zero by default, but now when I change it the default, it begins to move. And if I do let's say 0 0.6, mm, I don't know if it's visible, but uh, wait a second. Maybe it should be much bigger. I don't know how big this value is, but yeah, in general, we've broken this uh, repetition because here you can see it begins with this little cloud on the left. Well, in this module, it begins with the rougher noise. So we've added random UVs per mesh. As I said, it's not always applicable. It is when you have a divider like this, a pillar or something. Uh, sorry, give me a moment. Uh, there is some connection error or no. My chat has disappeared, so I don't know what has happened, actually. Mm. Oh, here is the chat. All right. Uh, Adel says, sorry for being late. No need to be sorry. <laughs> really. <laughs> Jump in whenever you feel like. Uh, so what happened? We added random, uh, random value to the UVs and they are randomized. Uh, I mean that sometimes you need this continuity, but for this it will be okay for now because we have these pillars which hide the seam. Let me show you what, what I mean. If I scale the pillar to zero, see, because of the randomization, we've basically broken the edge. It was already broken, never mind. But gen in general, uh, you can do it if you have a pillar like this. Uh, okay, uh, so let's convert it quickly to an actual texture because we don't want to spend nice, uh, you know, computation cycles on some noise that we can get from a texture. So this is will be, this will be my UVs. For clarity, we can now do a great thing. So basically, reroute node named declaration. And I name it randomized UV. Cool. Very clear. Readable. Awesome. Bartek Kaminski, thanks for joining us. Good to see you here, guy. And now I can. Take a dirt texture. Let's call it dirt. Do they have some dirt texture? Maybe they do. Uh, 
They have Rust. Rock. Rock is okay. I think it's okay. So this would be third uh, base color. Sorry, I'll make this bigger. And of course, third normal. Like this. Uh, and I can also do, if I'm on that, I can do third high link. Third high link. Just, you know, to disconnect it from the main UVs, it will probably need some more textile density. Okay, multiply to scale, add to offset. And this goes here. Now I need a mask. So mask... Mask should also be randomized, okay. But I need a different tiling, so mask tiling. You know, the alpha of the actual... Or maybe I don't... I do. Uh, mask tiling. Multiply. And add this whole randomization to the mask as well. Okay. And this will be my mask UVs. Hey, come on. Mask. Yeah, sometimes I think that I don't need something or don't need to expose. But then actually I realize it's just a two or three nodes to add. So why not? Uh, texture. I need a mask texture. Mask texture. And it needs to be grayscale because I want the mask of this dirt, so it's not applied to everything. Uh, let's find it. This looks okay. Maybe. It's okay. Uh, whoa. What? Maybe it's okay. Let's see. Let's first display this mask. Whoa, way too dense. Mask styling. I don't know if this is a good texture. Actually, let's try maybe power of the stuff. Uh, 0.5. Ah, the same as square root. Never mind. And yeah. Is it any better? It would be alright, I think. Okay. Uh let's do a high flurp. A high flurp. And yeah, I want this dirt to show on the near the floor, basic. So for the floor, I'd like to do I don't know, uh, hive min, dirt hive min. Uh, Bartek, you're asking if a square root node is cheaper than the power node. Uh, square root is an actual instruction of the GPU, so you have a higher chance that it would just be a single instruction. But honestly, very often compiler will just detect what you're trying to do with this power to 0 0.5, and it will convert it to a square root anyway. So it's up to you. This guarantees the stuff, while using power makes it more like you know, maybe you decide that 06 is better or 04. More configurable without commi committing to the exact square root. But of course, then such uh, special values will be a slightly more uh, complex than just square root. But I'd say begin with power for this elasticity and then 
optimize if it turns out the 0 0.5 is the best value. Okay, so as in the math tutorial, uh, remap value range. And what's the range? The range is my local position, Z. Local position component mask. So local position is position within this object. Okay. And one small thing, guys. Give me a moment. About this kind of stuff like local position or how to project textures, how to use WordSpace to, to distribute your textures. I'd like to recommend my previous video. It's here. Uh, word position effects in materials uh, on techartate.com or on my YouTube channel. It's all about this one hour. Okay. So basically, I don't know if you know, but techartate.com contains the history of all the stuff I do. You can jump straight there. There's also very useful stuff uh, about UV math here. How to, you know, generate texture coordinates dynamically. We'll return to that later uh, in this uh, session. Cool. So I take my local position and I want to have a gradient from 0 to 1, the, you know, the typical useful range for maths. So the output gradient will be from 0 to 1, but it will begin like I want uh, or actually for, from 1 to 0 because I want the dirt to start at the bottom uh, this will invert it and the old range, the initial range will be the five from some point up to some point in centimeters so up to 100 no, from 0 to 150 centimeters it will convert it to gradient from 1 to 0 uh, Jeffrey is asking, is component mask the same as the dot product between object space and the vector 3? Uh, for example, 0, 0, 1. Actually, it should be, yeah. Because dot product is like uh, x times x of the two vectors uh, plus y plus y plus uh, uh, y times y plus z times z. Basically, uh, comment basically dot sorry this node dot product the same thing as you know vectors 1x times vector 2x plus vectors 1y times vectors second y plus the z components of these two vectors okay so this is the dot product uh next uh so yeah you can use that product if you want as a kind of component mask but component mask is cheaper because in the shader code it will be used uh sorry comment component mask will be converted to code like for example uh new vector equals old vector and there is a so-called swizzle syntax, very useful. For example, rg will be rg or xy. But if you used, let's say, r and b, there is actually a syntax in HLSL, the shader programming language, for xz directly or rb. So, this is super cheap. Basically, it's like a, not an operation. It's just a swizzle on the fly. So while you can emulate it with dot product, I would only recommend it if you want a very configurable component mask. Okay, Jeffrey uh, saw that on Ryan Brooks' Twitter and was wondering why he would do that. I don't know, but I can imagine why. Uh, so... Let's say you want to expose which channels will be visible. So at the, for, to, to do that, you would get, for example, object position. And then you would do a dot product. So this multiplication, 
with a vector parameter and for example which axis visible okay and you make it uh, clamped or saturate between 0 and 1 saturate is a clamp between 0 and 1 mm. so in that regard if the user wants to use only the x position for something they will multiply that the x with 1 1 in math meaning no change and other stuff with 0 so it doesn't exist and if they want only the axis red and let's say purple uh, sorry blue then one here one here they use x and z skipping the y this way you can do that but it really depends okay there is also one, another thing there's component there's mask parameter now i believe it wasn't yeah static component mask parameter so which axis to use now you can just use checkboxes so maybe ryan was doing that in the time when when this thing wasn't in unreal already or he wanted to do something else like combine these values okay uh so i have that stuff i'm remapping z position to a gradient okay let's visualize that Whoa, why is taking so long? Shader compilation. Uh oh. It doesn't look good. Why doesn't it look good? Ah, I have the same. It should be hive there max. Hive there minimum is zero. Okay. Not yet. Maybe no. Sure, Jeffrey, you're welcome. I'm glad that you asked, really. In general, I, I encourage you guys to ask whenever you want to know something, either on topic or off topic. Okay, we got it. Hive mask from zero to some given hive. Okay. Uh, now to do something more interesting, we take this mask that we already had with the square root to make it brighter. And we will do a high flare using this. So again, this goes away. And this will be our my new favorite thing named reroot. And this will be our dirt mask uh, tiled. Okay. And this thing is our dirt gradient named reroot. The gradient. What? And I want to combine these two things into a single, you know, perturbed, more interesting gradient. So texture plus gradient. Actually, not plus, but high flerp. Uh, a and B doesn't matter because I don't want to use actual blend value. I only want this transition phase. So transition phase is my gradient. Hive texture is dirt mask tiled. And that's it. And that's also contrast. So dirt contrast. Like so. So high flip. How does this look like? I, as I said, I don't want the result of mixing any textures. I just want the alpha it uses internally. So like this. Kind of what I want it but not quite maybe the gradient is too low <laughs> better i need to lower contrast on this mask texture so there is this final output contrast it's okay i guess but i want the input contrast so let's take this texture maybe square is okay but what i want to do is cheap contrast i don't know if it's cheap they say it's cheap so maybe it is uh input contrast or maybe no dirt mask 
contrast. Let's check what values does it take. Let's try negative. Minus 0. Cool. Bad. Minus 0 too. Alright, that's kind of what I wanted. And now I want to increase the output contrast. 0 0.4. Or do I? Yes, I want. Oh, and we can also do some power of 2 on this gradient to make it more interesting. Basically, power on a linear value, it bends the curve, bends the plot. Let's see. Better. Uh, now it can be higher slightly. Okay, good enough. Now let's blend these things. I have my dirt here. I wanted to tint it a little. Perfect parameter. Uh, let's call it dirt color. And let's do this. Cool. And now I want to lerp. Lerp between the original brick wall and this dirt using this same alpha which I can name as dirt mask final okay here I will need it for other stuff as well because I also will need to blend normals in a second okay see dirt but the normal is old so I actually don't want to replace the normal beneath, I want to add to the normal beneath. So instead of lerping, what I will do is I will flatten the normal of this with my flatness being actual inverse of this mass. 1 minus x inverts a value. Black becomes white, white becomes black. So uh, inverted mask will flatten my normal of dirt and this will be combined with this normal so blend angle corrected don't you ever add two normals use this nice node blend angle corrected normals because it makes sure that the normal is correct rotation vector in the end see normals have combined i know it doesn't look like dirt Whatever. Good enough. Maybe you can use a different normal. It doesn't have to fit this so tightly. Let's try. Uh, this sandstone looks okay. Very good. Very nice normal. Perfect. So, we have some procedural dirt. Which means that now... Actually, I can see some repetition, but that's due to the tiling. But as you can see... This module has this bright spot on the middle. This module has it slightly on the left. This has it somewhere on the right. It's different. Three modules, different uh, mapping. Seven instances. Perfect. Now, the good thing is that in the blueprint, in the blueprint, everything, when in adding instance, it is a local transform. So. If I duplicated this stuff and rotate. Why is Unreal doing that? If I do Ctrl W, it slightly moves the actor. You see? Why is it doing that? Uh, Ctrl C, Ctrl V. Now if I rotate. You can see that the dirt follows. And the, the modules are rotated as well. So this is very good for level design. Uh, right. Now, what could be useful, let's go back into um, back to actual you know blueprint for now. What could be useful for level design is instead of putting some instance count and trying to fit the right position here, it could be better to have an actual gizmo in the world, right? To do that. So let's just do that. I'm gonna go inside. And I'm going to calculate the distance from origin 
to some gizmo to check how many instances do I need. Okay. I fortunately, fortunately have my mesh length and I'm sure I will screw the maths the first time. So please be patient and correct me. I'm very open for feedback. Just let me know on the chat. This is all good, but this is for later. Because my instance count will no longer be set by the user. I'm gonna delete this thing. From... I'm gonna not make it editable. I'm gonna calculate that. Mm -hmm. Landish, you are saying that uh, game dev took you on, on the tackered position from your hard surface, hard surface portfolio and you need to add some hard surface animation. Uh, would you like to expand on that? Like, do you find it, you know, uh, interesting? And basically, what areas of Unreal are you using for that? To add hard surface animation? Do you, do you prepare rigs in the some other tool or do you animate in Unreal? And is there some stuff that, for example, you would still like to learn, but uh, is like a missing piece in, in what you need in the skill set? Let me know. And in the meantime, I calculate this instance count. So I will add a variable. It will be uh, last instance end, like so. It will be a vector, a 3D position. And there is a very nice thing, show 3D widget. But instance editable, it has to be. Now I can show 3D widget. What it does, it's here. The value, value is last instance end, but now can, I can now click on this vector literally in the word and move it so it updates here in the properties page. Very useful, very, you know, graphical. So I can move this last instance end to here. And I wanted to calculate this distance and check how many instances it should be. Okay. So back to here. Okay. First, I need the distance. We decided upon x axis, so let it be x. I need the distance from this thing x to zero because we start from zero in local space. I'll calculate that into variable as well. So um, let's make a local variable. I will call it. I will call it distance to end and it will be basically this because normally I should subtract the origin to get the distance but origin is zero so just end x this is my distance to end I can print that just for debugging print string like this and you'll be able to see that now when I take this, when I move, you can see it printing the distance. Now it's negative. It's printing this distance. Actually, negative is still a valid use case, I think, but let's not support it now. I'm just gonna clamp it to make sure it's always bigger than zero or zero. So max the smallest distance we will support is let's say uh one centimeter okay one centimeter it will be this or more mm, so here and i will comment that prevent negative and zero distance Okay. Uh, Landish uh, says that he can rig and animate pieces than export to Unreal. Uh, 
and thinks that game dev made a huge mistake to hire him. No. <laughs> you're here, you're learning. So you're dedicated to it. Don't feel ashamed or an imposter. Interested in optimization, blueprint, post-processing. Under the hood of rendering. All right. That's good. I hope that at some point, but probably in a couple of months, we'll do some optimization streams as well. Or maybe it should be on other days. Uh, I had an idea of doing uh, streams where we test stuff. So basically checking which method is faster with actual performance comparison. But that's for the future, but just hinting. Okay. We have this distance to the end. What I want to do now is to divide this by uh, the mesh length to get the number of instances. So we did that. Now I want to take this and divide by divide by mesh length. So if I divide by mesh length, I should have the number of meshes that are required to fill this distance. However, it will have also val values after the decimal point. Let me prove it by printing again, like this. Okay, we have this. Ah, you can see it because it's too high. Maybe now I move this and you can see it's five pieces now precisely but now it's 5.15 5.40 and so on so unusable for our cause so what we can do we can either round up or round down let's round down but it's up to you let's take this thing that we have and round we can also round but round is more expensive seal takes it to the higher value floor put the lower value and immediately gives us an integer very good let's set instance count which is no longer editable for the user let's set it uh, other asks uh, that I, sh I should scale assets exactly exactly that's what we're gonna try in a moment but first let's try this but huge thanks for this advice uh, it's also a very elegant solution for now let's clamp it to the lower and yeah instance count remains here not longer from the user now it's from code go uh Last instance end. Nice. They disappear or appear when we move the end target. But yeah, exactly this is what Adder was uh, saying. Now we would love it to snap perfectly here, but it does. It's either too much or too little. So let's scale that. Let's add some scaling. Mm. And now I can screw up the math. Let me know. Uh, what we want to do is we want for all these meshes to match the perfect, the ideal distance. So this, you know, this distance without any floor. Mm. Give me a moment. Think. So the scale Yeah, so the scale should be big enough for all this combined length to match the ideal length. Uh, so this is the Floor. Uh, 
This is the ideal length. Distance to end. Uh, and this is the true length. Okay. Let's convert it to float again. And basically, idea divided by this floor. Give me a second. Uh, because now this is not a distance. Now this is the amount of instances. But it should be the same. Let's check. So this is the, let's say, ideal number of instances with the decimal places. This is rounded. I think this should be our scale. Let's try. Let's add a... Mm, scale to match end. And set this. Hello, Piet Nashki. Uh, I'm going to take... I've set, set the scale. Now I'm going to use the scale. I want to multiply that, but only in one axis. So, split, multiply, by scale to match, and here. Uh-oh, sorry. Make like so, maybe doesn't work. It didn't do anything. So we have a math problem to solve. But does it work like at all? If I let's say set it to constant to Huh, I connected it to the pillar. <laughs> I connected it to the pillar. This is not what I should have done. I can just break this down. Okay. Recombine. Hey! Recombine. Okay, it should be a scale of the wall. Not of the pillar. Hmm. Ah, because it's just constant two. Better. Kind of. But not quite. Mm, no, it doesn't work right. Guys, if you see the problem, let me know. This has to end by the mesh length. Gives us the number of instances that should be like an ideal number of instances. This is cut trimmed down to an integer. And what? And, and this is divided by this. What's the problem? How about seal? Instead of the floor, okay. Similar issue, but the other way around. I know what's going on, guys. I know what's going on. Uh, we scale the mesh itself, but we... Uh, but we don't scale the location. So, also, this thing should be multiplied. You know, like that. So not just the scale, but also the location. Now it will work. I hope. Yes, it does. Like a charm. See? 
Now the same location. Ah, it's already used for the pillar. Perfect. <laughs> round man. I don't have to. It works fine, but round. Uh, could you use modulo for that? Could I use modulo? Modulo is basically giving me the remaining part uh, of the number after division. Maybe I could. I don't know. I'm not sure. Modulo is very useful, but maybe it can also be used here. Uh, yeah, I get what you mean. Instead of this dividing and this stuff. Maybe. It would be good if, if you can check, because it sounds interesting. It will save us a, a lot of calculations. Let's try if rounding will give the same result, but better fitting this stuff. Because other can be right here. It can be onto something. Yep, round behaves better. Like more snappy, let's say. It reaches the right scale quicker. So it's either smaller or bigger, not just only bigger. All right, so we have our wall instancer. Wall is ready to deploy. This cool. Okay, so we got that. I think the next step would be to add a modular floor. Uh, with texture without any, you know, a seamless texture. So we'll do procedural UVs for that. And slowly we can go towards uh, placing some decorations on the wall. Mm, for the decorations, what I will try to do is I will try to place volumes. Pain causing volume. No, any volumes, whatever, just to, just to show the example. What I will try to do uh, later is placing some volumes on the wall, also procedurally a little, and trying to find the best mesh that fits this given box. Okay? So for example here, it should randomize between several small objects, while here between bigger objects. I'm not sure yet how I will do that, but let's see. Uh, do you have some questions already? So, the goal is to place some decorations on this stuff. Mm. We'll need to randomize meshes, so we'll need to choose what kinds of meshes to place. Uh, instead of doing some super, you know, or maybe we can actually do it, we can do uh, Raycast to test the position on, on the surface, because this wall example is very uh, simple. But if our wall had some protrusions, we, we want to find the actual contact point. Mm. This size uh, randomization and choices will come later. Right now, let's just try placing without, you know, caring about the size. So, this is good. I'm gonna pack this into functions just for clarity. So, this will become my function. I will call it uh, initialize. Okay. This will be mm, this would be a pure function. Pure meaning it doesn't change anything, it just calculates. So pure uh, get mesh length or calc mesh length. Okay. Uh, this will be, this is very simple, but we can do with a function. Uh, pure. And this will be like distance to end. And this, this is going to be, uh, we'll need both, so, more like this, comes to function, 
here. This would be Kirk instance count and scale. Okay. Here is a little problem, so uh, let's already talk about optimization. Unfortunately, pure functions, when connected multiple times, they will recalculate themselves every time for every pin. This is really not ideal. This is a problem with Unreal, because typical compilers can do it. Uh, they can realize that this is calculated only once, and then you know to store the variable somewhere. Unreal doesn't do it. Pure are expensive in, in the way that using them multiple times costs you uh, every time. The entire function. So, while this could be pure, logically, let's make it standard. Mm. This will come here and here. <sighs> this should be called uh, instance count, and this is pair to match and. Okay? Yeah, exactly. Piatnaszki, you're, you're right. That uh, doing a for loop when every loop uh, calls a pure function, it, it's a hardcore. It's better to store it in some local variables and do a standard, uh, not pure if possible. Mm, just optimization, you know. If you do something only once or very simple like this, then pure is perfectly fine. It also makes the intent very clear that this function won't modify your mesh or anything. It will just calculate. So it's a little a pity that uh, peers aren't better optimized. Uh, this I will call basically, I may need this for loop. Okay, so I will put this into a function and I will call it, uh, this will be the instance index. And I will call that uh, add instance, okay? Or add module, not to confuse it with the official Unreal function. I recommend packing stuff into functions because it makes the intent clearer. So someone jumps into your code, just looks at it and, okay, so what does it do? Hmm. It initializes. Uh, calculate some stuff, calculate the instance count, and then adds this uh, number of instances. Okay. So yeah, uh, packing for into functions is good for readability, especially for other people. Compile. It can't find something where. Why? Because it was a local variable. All right. All right, I get it. Uh, let's add inputs. Load. Instance. Mm. Like so. The same here. I wonder why it didn't like find it by itself. Uh, okay. 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 I think we're good. Good. Now I just need to connect this stuff back. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. It works again. Just to remind you, 
it tries to find the best number of instances and scales their location and size to fit exactly our gizmo, which is an advanced instance and a vector with show 3D widget enabled. So just a slight reminder for those of you who, who jump later. Okay, this is it. Now I'm placing decorations. So let's say that for every module, it should either pick one or two decoration meshes and place them accordingly mm, in some random spot on this mesh bounce. Mm. So what we're gonna do? We're going to uh, make another function per module uh, uh, let's call it uh, add decorations okay UX tip if you drop the variable on the pin it connects automatically says Jeffrey okay uh, so if I connect this here whoa thank you very good I remember that I try to thanks Jeffrey add decorations uh, so yeah one or two decorations so the first thing we need to randomize how many here's a catch there are many random functions and let's say we want random integer in range and there is in range or in range from stream what's the difference the difference is that random integer in range is completely random no matter what so you slightly tweak your construction script and then you get totally different numbers every time every you know frame or change while random integer in range from stream it uses a seed seed basically is a number that uh, makes the the whole thing predictable so if you want to change the positions you should change the seed but doing stuff like moving this object or you know scaling it it won't affect the random uh, result so it's pseudo random it's the same every time for the given seed the given iteration let's try that let's try random integer in range from stream it asks for a stream this is just a variable that we need to create nothing else so just in variables random stream <coughs> and you do a type stream random stream that's it that's everything you have to do mm, it has initial seed that's what i mean but for now we don't care zero is okay ah, minimum number zero okay let's say it will go from zero to three decorations for now for now maybe it will be better uh, so when we want to add decorations it takes this mm, now the problem is we'll get the same result for every mod let's try mm. so we get the let's store it into local variable uh, it will be uh, decoration count number of decorations right let's start it mm. and now we want to pick three random points within the the mesh so what we do we need our meshes where's the mesh module in the mesh module uh, extends again so bounce get bounce and now there is a function get random point oh, oh no random point in bounding box this is it it asks for origin and extent and this is fortunately what we get from get bounce just split the struct origin which is the pivot or actually no this is the middle the midpoint of the mesh and box extend the half size of the mesh 
we just give this and we get random point. Now to check what it did, we will show it. So draw sphere, draw debug sphere. We'll draw the debug sphere for the duration of half a second or maybe more. We'll see. Maybe more. One sec. Uh, center is this point we randomized. And small radius. Okay. Thickness. No. Cool. I don't know what this is actually. Let's try. Uh, it doesn't compile. Stream is invalid because I haven't pinned in this tree. Okay, cool. Now it doesn't do anything yet because it's not connected. Mm, add decorations here. Okay, cool. So for every module. Ah, and we need this location of this mesh, of this thing. So we create it here, it should return it. So let's add the return node. We will need this transform. And yeah. It will return index and thank you, Jeffrey, for this tip and transform like so. Uh, index. Yeah. Cool. Go back here to the main thing. Okay, we got our index, we got our transform. Huh. Now we need to add this. So it will be module transform. Okay. Um, now we have it. So we can add this to this randomized point. We got a random point within object space. And now I want to transform this by this module transform. Transform. Make transform. No. I want to transform a point. Transform location. Yeah. I want to transform a location. So basically move this point into another space. Space of this module, but still within this blueprint. And only after this, I want to transform it actor to world. Uh, well, get transform, get actor transform. Okay, this is this blueprint transform, and I want to transform this again. So again, transform point. Hey, transform point. Ah, transform location. And this requires stuff in word space. That's why I'm doing that. This drawing. Cool. Let's try. We have something. Have you seen? It randomizes some points, but never outside of the modules. Very cool. Uh, now it's doing this only once. So we need a for loop. Uh, we need a for loop. For each. Not for each. Just for loop. Come on, Unreal. You can do that. Thank you. Mm, subtract one as usual. Okay, so for the given number of times per module, let's draw some, let's get some random point. I can also hug this into a function, I believe. Collapse the function, pure, and it will be get random point uh, within module and the result is actually I can get this transform outside 
go to the outside. Okay, this is local position. Local location? Sounds stupid. Local position. Cool. Let's see. It doesn't do anything now. Why it stopped working? Let's say without this stuff. Just... Just like that. Huh. But also now we have a problem. So this random point in bounding box seems to be totally random. Which is not good. It's not good because it doesn't give us a way to use a seed. Let's see if we have something based on the stream. Random, maybe there's random... Unit vector. Perfect. Let's do that. Let's replace it. We don't want it to be completely random. Mm. Random vector. Uh, from stream. Unit vector is a vector that is a length of one. Which is like kind of okay, I guess. Hmm. It may be okay. Should be okay. Uh, okay. I would actually prefer random floats that are between 0 and 1. So, random float from in range from stream. Okay, cool. From stream. From 0 to 1. Uh, but it means that we should also randomize this stream a little. Let's try. Mm. Now, get bounce. Okay, I want to replace that thing. So, I'm gonna get random x, y, and z. Uh, Jeffrey asks that uh, what is uh, random in stream. So, I don't know what's exactly this stream, but it's like a random number generator. It makes sure that... Th this is the problem we have here. This is the random point. Typical random without stream. And what happens is that when I change anything, we get completely different set of points every time, which will be very bad if we just want to, let's say, move it, move it a little, and our uh, our decorations will be randomized completely. We want something more predictable, deterministic. So here comes our stream. The stream is this random number generator mechanism uh, that has a seed. So when we click on the stream, you can see there is an initial seed to it. Uh, and I think it will be clear in a moment when I replace this random function with this stream stuff. So I'm gonna pick x and y randomly. Uh, sorry, uh, x and z from the stream. Uh, the stream will mean that I get the same result, so we'll replace it with something in a moment. Expand it, actually. But for now, just to, to, sh to show the basics. Mm. I get this. I make a vector. Vector. This one x, this is z. Uh, now I'm going to... Actually, no. It will be between minus 1 and 1. Because our extents are half of the mesh. So I'm going to multiply that by extends, and I'm going to add origin to move it to the right position, okay? So I, I get some number between my, minus 1 and 1, scale it by the size of the mesh, the extends, and then add the origin to move it to the modules position, this given module. I'll use that instead of this. Probably. No. I don't need that because I've already added... Ah, oh, no, it's okay. I need that. 
So I replace that with my custom function, but with stream. Let's see. Yep. Now every time they land in the same spot. Can you see? They land in the same place. Whatever the small changes don't matter to it. I'm doing small changes. They land in the same place. <laughs> Star Pony says this classic nomenclature problem. So naming convention. How to do how to name something that's random but it's not random. Uh, yeah. Deterministic. So randomness with predictable flow. Okay. There is a seed. And check now. Seed is zero. It lands here. Seed zero lands here again. But when I change the seed to one, to let's say two. Okay, 200. Oh, come on. Prove my point. Zero. Okay, something doesn't work. It's bad. Hmm. But why? I have my random stream. The initial seed should change its random values. Or maybe the math is wrong somehow. Let me add more modules. Let's see if they get their own points. They kind of do. Yeah. Something is off because sometimes they land near the zero. Very unrandom. But honestly, changing the seed should, should change the stuff. So zero is here, but let's say 500. Nothing. Nothing changes. What if... Hmm. Let's print this. Let's print this. Let's see what we get as this random stuff without any transforms yet. Okay, we're getting something. Zero, four, seven, six. Okay, let's change the seed in this random stream. Same values. Any ideas? Out there? Maybe you? No? What I'm doing wrong? In the meantime, I can try uh, random stream. Set. Random sim stream seed. Uh, maybe this will help. 400. Yeah. Now it's different. That's interesting. So it seems like we really need to explicitly set random sim stream seed. I don't know. Okay, but it should help, I think. So our seed will be just the number of the instance. Mm. So we need, we need a instance index. Okay. And I will make our, my own variable seed that will be added. Just to, you know, to have some control. Uh, so seed, random seed, will be added to this number of instance index. So this means that I have my seed, but it will be different for every instance, meaning it, every instance should get cited, should get different uh, values here. Okay, uh, let's do a sequence because it became very unreadable. Sequence. Okay, let's begin by setting the random stream seed like so and then continue continue to calculate all this stuff. Okay, I don't need this print anymore. 
this is transformed. What I want to do is pack it probably. Okay, I'm setting it seed. That's good. Oh, come on. Come on. Set initial. Set seed pair. Instance. And this. This is get a random position within instance within modules bounds. Cool. And here comment transform the word space. Cool. Let's try. We are getting something, but very weird because it's very... Ah, uh, because we hadn't connected this. Uh, so where we have our get random point within module, I also need to add an index like so which means that i have to do it here as well perfect okay now maybe yep seems random though the z is somehow wrong it's the same let's go back here Get random position within module. Oh yes. I do another transform? Ah, to word space. So this wasn't word space. This was this was something else. What is it? Module transform. Ah, transform to blueprint space. So this blueprint space. Or actually to uh, instancing component space. Okay, cool. Uh, so what's going on? We're getting number... Ah! We're setting the seed, but we need to do it again. Because we want two different values for two different axes. So, yeah. We want to do that. Then we want to actually pick uh what local mm, we want to pick uh random x like so uh, yeah then we want to do is do this again but with a different number. Mm. So let's need per instance for x axis. And now same thing, but for z axis. Uh, random seed plus instance index plus some whatever. One, two, three, four. Okay. Just so that it's different for z. Mm. Add this again here. Uh, get random X. Cool. Now, uh, here we're gonna have. Uh, random Z. Perfect. Comment. Uh, get random Z. So yeah, we're setting the seed, getting the random number for X axis, uh, changing the seed again. Uh-oh. 
and then getting a random z axis number. Uh, this will serve us here to get the final random position. Uh, where's my random x? <gasps> I made it just a variable. Can I move that? Ah, I can't. Promote to local a random z. Cool. Now, random x, random z. Like so. Does it look correct? I multiply it by x tens. And then I add origin. Why do I have to add origin? Ah, because the extents are calculated from origin. And then I transform it to this component space. But, uh, no. Or actually, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it should be good. And then I return. Let's try. But we're getting the same same thing which is weird or, or not the same but this is very wrong wait a second yeah z is different x is different so it's different for every instance so what the hell uh get bounds yeah this is all right so what we produce looks all right let's print this looks very not very different it's like 20 centimeters difference ah i'm lost give me a second time for education Random streams allow repeatable random numbers to be generated and used inside of blueprints and level blueprints. This can be extremely useful when scattering objects or building procedural environments. Modifying the initial seed. I think I kind of get it now. So the thing is that we shouldn't be setting the special stuff because it will always give us new numbers. Let's try. I will disconnect setting the seed. Yes, I guess. Now they are in the same spot, but outside of bounds. But yeah, we're onto something. Okay, guys, so sorry, I was mistaken. I thought that we need to provide the seed for every instance, like, you know, the seed in the noise, like in Houdini. But it turns out that Unreal is doing that itself like giving us the next number from the sequence not the noise at the specific point so sorry for that i confused it totally with like houdini and noises work so we probably don't need that and we probably don't need that and this is the only things we need getting numbers and it will um, pick the next thing from the sequence every when we do this random float in range from stream which is weird because this is pure but whatever i thought that pure you know shouldn't modify stuff uh maybe that's an exception we're getting something something super random uh ah because it's not scaled uh range yes range yeah thanks a lot Okay, perfect. We're on to something. Uh, it does work. It's in the same place always. Now, finally, placing a decoration. Uh -huh. Okay, so we get that. I think an instance, not the function. Add decorations. Okay, so here we get this random stuff in word space. Now we want to do it three times to get three points.
like so. Cool, three points. The proper workflow here would be to detect if they are too close to each other and then try again. But of course, let's not polish these things on the stream. It's already uh, a long time. Uh, Adder, you can make a clip on Twitch of this huge success. <laughs> because Adder said that this was a triumph. Thank you. Uh, cool. Let's place stuff. Let's place stuff. And now, instead of a single mesh, I will add a static mesh type. That mesh of, uh, yeah, but this would be an array of static meshes. So, decoration meshes. This will allow us to pick a random decoration from the whole array. Okay? So, sure, we're getting this nice sphere. What about instead we just added a component? And now we have a dilemma because instancing is great. But also, uh, it would be easier to begin with just adding a new mesh component. It will be heavy, so it's not a pattern to follow, but just to make things simpler. Instead of adding an instancer for every type of decoration, I would just pick a random thing from the array and add static mesh component. Well, you normally shouldn't do that because having separate mesh components is heavy. It's normally quite heavy. So you would rather create instancer for every type of mesh and then add instances there. But for now, this is okay. We're just playing around, right? Mm. So I'm adding static mesh component. This is the component. I'm giving it a relative transform, so not word. Word is not needed. I'm a relative transform, so split location. Relative rotation, we will see. Uh, manual attachment, no. It should automatically attach to the parent. Uh, the advantage, uh, Jeffrey asks, what's the advantage of component then? The advantage is the easy, uh, how easy it is to add it. Because to create instances, uh, I will have to make a new instance, you know, hierarchical instance of mesh component for every decoration type. And we don't need, don't know the decoration types in advance. So I would have to do this at the very beginning and so on. So instead, it is it's the good solution, of course. But for now, for simplicity, I will just add static mesh component based on whatever I have at hand. Uh, just a hacky way to add stuff. I recommend you to add stuff in a very dirty way. Super sketch, you know, whatever. Uh, unless you know that this is the correct solution. You, not to waste time. Experiment quickly and drop quickly, just, you know. Uh, only when you have the satisfying result, then optimize uh, the proper way. Though, think, uh, like, don't leave optimization after the very end. Think of optimization more like uh, if I, if it can work at all. For example, what is the number of meshes I will have what is the potential, you know, size, memory size, the number of uh, materials. This is good to know in advance, even in prototype, but not uh, go into super detail too early. Okay, so decoration meshes. I want, I need to know how many of them do we have, so length. This is how many decoration meshes we have. And I'm going to pick from the stream, from this cursed random stream i'm gonna pick integer in range from minimum to length minus one this way i will have a random decoration mesh which i can then get so get this from my array 
random decoration and when I add my static mesh component I want to have mm, I want to have set mesh set mesh to this mesh okay one thing though one thing no collision like so can characters step on it no generate events no perfect decoration is empty so it's doing nothing then we can populate this array let's add some free nice meshes uh let's add something small okay do we have something small statue uh a cube with chamfer and sphere perfect okay we got it as you can see decorations placed the problem is these decorations have pivot in a very bad place in the inside in the middle but whatever and now look now because we base it on random stream uh i don't mean my random stream on twitch but random stream uh, variable type uh when i move this oh i can't move what why come on okay see when i move it very slightly this kind of the same stuff is picked in similar places it only changes when the number of instances changes so for example now right but in general the first instance stays unchanged so very deterministic very predictable and we have some nice decorations. Oh. So that's already a long session, guys. It is almost three hours. So, time for your questions. Prepare what you would like to see. Uh, like, uh, let me know uh, what you would like to see with this in the next stream. I guess we should try this size and this placement thing so that it's not completely random uh, to allow for some really let's say manual adjustments to all this for example we can place a volume within within which it will be taken not entire module but you know for example that decorations will only spawn in such box right and later, I think, what we will try to do on the next stream is to populate the world with a ton of this kind of stuff to really build a level. Really like, you know, a lot of this stuff. Different kind of them. Uh, we'll build some level. we we'll add procedural floors that make some sense. And then we'll test... What is the performance we can get of this and what problems do we encounter? And I think in the same or the next stream, the third stream, uh, we can try to destroy this. So right now this is super clean. Like so. Right, this is always the same stuff. There's some nice dirt, but this is just basically some shader trick. I think we should try to place actually destroyed modules or even using the chaos system, we'll see. Uh, add some rubble with physics placed on top. So, you know, cast down and colliding with the floor to add a life to that and a variety, some, some history. Okay? Basically build a real life example. Every Thursday we'll have this, like actual building stuff and, you know, professional stuff. But I will try to think of a way to do some uh, chilled out chat or some experiments in the meantime, okay? See ya!